Hey everybody, welcome back to the future. That is today's sermon title as we go through this Advent season. That's right, I said the sermon title is Back to the Future. Uh, perhaps you have seen the classic movie with Marty McFly and Doc uh, where they had to go back to the future and the time travel. Um, now we're gonna be preaching today not on those videos, but uh, definitely use that name uh, to catch your attention of traveling back to the future. Doesn't make any sense, right? Well, Advent, as we go through this season, is a prophetic reminder of the last days. And it's, it's what has happened and what is to come. So as we get ready for Christmas, we look back and we anticipate for what is coming down the road. We don't just remember the past, but we remember the future. And that is our understanding of what scripture says of what is to come and what Christ has already done for us and what he will do. I had a conversation with the other, um, the other day with someone who uh, uh, doesn't celebrate Christmas. Uh, they are a Christian and they're like, we don't need to celebrate Christmas. You know, their, their thought process uh, was all about, well, we know December 25th isn't Jesus's birthday. And I'm like, yep, I know that. And I make that very clear. We, we know it's not his true birthday. And there's some discussions about when Jesus' birthday is, if it's in March or September. Um, but the point of it, in my opinion, is fairly irrelevant as to when Jesus' birthday is. Because as we go into Advent, we're just taking the time, one time a year, to stop. And yes, I understand some people say December 25th, it is a pagan a holiday and at one time it was and Christianity did take it over. I don't disagree with any of that. But what we do now is we take December 25th and we stop each year and we say, hey, we are going to celebrate what God has done and what he's going to do. And my question to this person that didn't celebrate Christmas was, I feel is completely fine if that's how they feel. But my question to them is I said, when do you celebrate Jesus's second coming because really as we anticipate december 25th it's just an arbitrary number on a calendar that gives us a time to anticipate when christ is coming we don't know when he's coming again anyway so we stick a date on the calendar and we build up with anticipation and year after year it kind of resets us to live our life of an attitude of when is christ coming see this is kind of that mystery of faith. If you've heard the Eucharistic prayer, Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ will come again. Christmas, we're remembering that Christ was born, he lived, he died, he lives again, and he will come again. See, as Christians, the celebration of Christmas is actually a celebration of the past and the future in the present. That's what Christmas is. Now, there's things that don't make sense, right? How can we celebrate the past, the present, and the future? How can we celebrate peace on earth? How can we celebrate going back to the future or water flowing uphill? These things just don't make sense. Well, let's, let's dive into our first scripture for today, and this is Isaiah chapter 2, uh, four verses out of there. Uh, I guarantee you, you have heard this at some point, especially when there's times of war. Verse 2, 4 gets brought up all the time. But this is Isaiah, and he says this. This is a vision that Isaiah, son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. In the last days, the mountain of the Lord's house will be the highest of all, the most important place on earth. It will be raised above the other hills, and people from all over the world will stream there to worship. People from many nations will come and say, Come, let us go to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of Jacob's God. There he will teach us his ways, and we will walk in his paths. For the Lord's teaching will go out from Zion. His word will go out from Jerusalem. The Lord will mediate between nations. It will settle international disputes. They will hammer their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will no longer fight against nation, nor train for war anymore. The Lord had a blessing the reading of his word. Now, I guarantee you that fourth verse you have heard before. Somewhere you've seen it um, brought up. They'll hammer their swords into plowshares. They won't train for war anymore. 
Guys, you see, peace is a gift from God. And the biblical understanding of peace doesn't equate with just the absence of war and conflict. The biblical understanding of peace, or the word that you may hear sometimes is shalom. Shalom is so much more. It's a completeness. Shalom means wholeness, completeness, health, safety, harmony, and prosperity. It's a complete well-being. It's a commitment to perfection, you almost may say. That is why you see in 2.4, not only will the people take their swords and beat them into plowshares, but the second half of that says they won't even train for war anymore. This is a complete 100% dedication and involvement to not fighting, to living in a time of peace. Now, I want you to think of the nation of Switzerland. They're a neutral country, haven't been in a war for a really, really long time. Yet every one of their men, as they come to age, are required to go into service and to train. Now, Switzerland, they're neutral, haven't had to fight in a war for a long time, but they're still training for war just in case. This scripture says there'll come a time when every nation will come together. Put this into modern day perspective. I want you to think about um, in this vision that Isaiah has, where he says every nation will come together. Think of the problems going on right now in Ukraine and Russia. Put this into modern day perspective. Could you imagine Vladimir Putin going to God? It says all nations will walk up this hill. In this vision, it's painting a picture of all of the highest and the mightiest of people going up, kind of like water flowing up a hill. You, you don't see it. Could you imagine, I believe it's President Xi, the Chinese leader, going to God? What about North Korea's dictatorship? Could you imagine that dynasty going to God? Or not making a political statement, even here in the U.S., our own president and our own leaders going to God first. And they go to God first, and God mediates for them. And all disputes are done. We hear about this scripture, but when you put it into, you know, modern day, think of Israel and Hamas. Their leaders going together to God and he mediates and both sides puts down their weapons. Think about this, even throw the U.S. and Russia together and all of a sudden they come together before God and we decide to tear our nuclear weapons apart. Because it is a complete commitment to peace. That is unshakable shalom. Goodwill on earth, goodwill to humanity. You're going to hear a little bit about that in the end in Luke 2.14. You see, our God is the God of Shalom. And his son, Jesus Christ, is known as the Prince of Peace. There's no other source of permanent peace available to, available to us. It's only Jesus Christ. Now, you and I are challenged to be peacemakers in this life. Now, that's not easy. Those of you that know me, uh, I tend to uh, dig my heels in, and there's times that I like to stand my ground and fight. And I do believe if you read through scripture, I mean, we are meant to be courageous men, and we are called to be warriors, and there is a time for battle. But we are called to be peacemakers as well. Now, the other day, uh, I was dealing with something uh, in my personal life with an issue that my sons got to see that was going on. And there was a, something that took place that um, we, me and my family, had the potential legally to benefit from something quite greatly. We could have increased some assets legally. But it wasn't the right thing to do. It was legal, but I knew right from wrong. My oldest son says to me that night, we were kind of bummed because in, honestly, in retrospect, it hurt us not to do it this way, not to go after legal action. And Job says to me, he says, Dad, he says, I understand what you're saying, that it wasn't right, but why didn't we do it? Look at what we just lost. 
I said to him, I said, Job, I said, just because you can doesn't mean you should. See, we're called to be peacemakers, and unfortunately, sometimes doing the right thing doesn't benefit you. But Jesus was pretty clear when he went through the Beatitudes, and he said, blessed are the peacemakers. Now, as we go through this Christmas season, you see on Sunday, uh, the second week, we lit the candle of peace. And that peace that we talk about is shalom. What was given to us, Jesus Christ, peace on earth. And currently, as we celebrate each year, knowing that December 25th isn't Jesus' birthday, but building up for a date, we're living in this time of what has already been and the not yet. We live in the time that he was born until the time that he returns. So when we go through celebrating Christmas and Advent, we remember the future. That's the, the other half of this Christmas season. We remember what is to come. It gives us a new perspective and it can work on and build our unshakable shalom. So we remember the future. This is a lesson that we must learn in anticipation for Christmas. And here's the great thing about it. Jesus, I'm sorry, uh, God the Father doesn't want you and I to be spectators in what he is doing. He wants us to be on the front lines. We're called to do something, right? So this is an act in our life, being peacemakers. And he throws us in and says, hey, wherever you're at in your life, this is what you need to do. You need to work towards this perfection of peacemaking. We're not spectators of what God is doing, but we're co-workers with him here now in the present, remembering the past and anticipating the future. This is where we slide over to Ephesians 5, 15 through 17. 16 is the main emphasis here, but I put the two around it so you understand a little bit more. And this is how we're told to live. Word of the Lord says this, so be careful how you live. Don't live like fools, but like those who are wise. Verse 16, make the most of every opportunity of these evil days. Don't act thoughtlessly, but understand what the Lord wants you to do. See, remembering the future is what the apostles mean when he, account, when he counsels in the Ephesians. He says, listen, put everything in its right place and right time. I'll knock this down a little bit right here in this moment that you live in is a time that you have been given the opportunity to work towards peace. You have the opportunity to choose peace or not. And there are times, and, and that's why the scripture says, make the most of every opportunity in these evil days. There are times where we may have to stand and fight. But there are times where just because we can doesn't mean we should. Remembering the future is to understand that our present life is in preparation for God's future. And this life is not a life of self-satisfaction, but a total commitment to a new way of life. And this is where the conversation that I had with Job of, in this particular instance, I feel someone else was way focused on themselves. And what they did, they, they could do, and we could have legally changed things. But it wasn't right. See, I'm not supposed to be focused on the things that I want in life. And this really hurt what we lost the other day. But self satisfaction isn't what we're supposed to go after. Now, I want to swing this back as we celebrate this Advent time. I want to swing into uh, some pretty common scripture. You've heard in Luke chapter 2. I even hinted at it earlier. And this is Luke chapter 2, verse 14. I didn't read all of it around it. I'm just reading this one line. And hopefully you've heard this before and you can build the context. If not, I'll, I'll explain. But this is Luke chapter 2, verse 14. 
It says, glory to God in the highest heaven and peace on earth with whom God is pleased. This scripture here, if you've ever heard it before, glory to God in the highest heaven, think about who's saying that. Think it's Luke chapter two. It's early in the Bible. So what has just happened here? You have the angels that are saying this. Glory to God in the highest heaven and peace on earth to whom God is pleased. These angels are saying it to shepherds in the field because something miraculous has just happened. You know what that is? Jesus Christ has just been born. The only peace on earth is in a baby. Peace has finally been brought to us. And these angels, for our Christmas play here, we're doing a shadow play off of Mary, Did You Know? And there's a line in there, if you've ever heard that song, uh, Mary, did you know that your baby boy has stood where angels trod? We have these angels now looking down and saying, listen, that guy, Jesus Christ, who was with us, has now came down to you. And he is bringing you the only hope of peace on earth going back to the Lord's future reign in Isaiah. This is the fulfillment of the prophecy. Jesus Christ is coming down to give us true peace, true shalom, where there's no need for weapons or war anymore. Those angels are saying, from heaven to earth, peace has entered into your world. So as we go through Advent, and once again to bring it out, several times over as we celebrate December 25th, even though it isn't Jesus's birthday, actually. It's because we anticipate what God is to do. We don't know when the second coming of Christ is going to happen, but we look forward to that day when peace on earth is fully restored. Last week and the first week, we had the hope of what is to come. We celebrate through the Advent season having the hope anticipating the peace. We remember what happens in the past. We live into it in the present. And we celebrate remembering the future of what is to come. So I challenge you today as you hear this sermon, I challenge you to remember the future. Or if we want to go back to the movie title, go back to the future. Anticipate and get excited for the peace that is to come. When the fulfillment of this prophecy says, nation will no longer fight against nation, nor train for war anymore. See, Jesus Christ, his birth, we celebrate it because that's the only hope for peace in this world. And peace has been given to us. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, uh, Lord, we thank you for your scripture and for your word. Uh, Lord, I pray for whoever is listening to this. Maybe they're in a stage in their life right now where peace is far from them. Uh, you know, Christmas season can be so uh, stressful. It's almost like Satan's ticked off and he doesn't want us to enjoy the peace of this season. But Lord, remind us once more of what you did in the past. Let us celebrate it in the present and let us remember the future. Lord, it's in your Son, Jesus Christ, our Messiah, we pray. Amen. Thank you, guys. Don't forget, give each other a little grace. See ya. Hey, thank you for watching our videos. Guess what? You get a first look. You can either scan the QR code or link in the description for our new website. Check it out. Thank you. Like, subscribe, and have a blessed day.